Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Today we want to talk about this subject of kingdom representation. We're going to focus on understanding and rediscovering the original role and purpose of the church. We're talking about the kingdom and what the church is in relationship to the kingdom of God. I want to begin with just a few comments with regarding the context. The original and ultimate goal of God for man was the establishment of his heavenly kingdom on earth through his sons. That one sentence explains the entire Bible. The original and ultimate goal of God for mankind was to establish his heavenly, that's the invisible, kingdom on earth, that's a physical place, through his sons, that's us. That's, what, that's all God wanted. Jesus stated very clearly what his mission was in Luke chapter 4, verse 42. Let's read it. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I came. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the other towns also because that is why I came. Christ is not wanting you to guess his assignment. He's not wanting you to guess his primary objective. Now you would have thought that he would have said, I must preach the gospel of Calvary and my death on the cross and the blood I will shed for your salvation and I will be buried three days, rise again and that's why I came. Because that is the message the church has been preaching for the past 2,000 years. Jesus said that's not the good news. The good news is not really Calvary. It's not the good news. I'll give an example because I think you may get a little concerned with the statement. All right. Suppose you inherited five million dollars. Would you like that? A bank has five million dollars that belongs to you. You haven't gotten it yet. In the process, somebody, somebody stole your bank book and they've been defrauding you they have been imitating your signature and stealing your money. And you've been living in poverty because you could not get the money that belongs to you. The five million dollars. I come into your life and I said, look, I have a way to get your five million dollars back. I'm going to go to the guy who got your bank book. I'm going to take it from him. So you can get the five million dollars. Now, what do you want? You want the bank book or the five million dollars? See, that's a businessman. He knows how to think. See? There's a difference. The bank book is not money. <laughs> the money is where? In the bank. You don't want the book. You want the money. A lot of you got checking books right now, but you ain't got no money. The book is not the money. The money is the stuff in the bank. So here I come. I go to the guy's house who has your, your checkbook. I bind him. I bind him in, in the house, tie him up, and took the book from him. And I come back to you. Now, when I came to you first, what's the good news? You can get your $5 million back. The good news is not you can get your checkbook back. That's the process. What you want is the money. You don't want the book. You want to get to your money. 
Well, Jesus came to bring back to us the kingdom of God. Calvary was getting the book back. Christ says, no man enters a strong man's house unless he first binds the strong man. But that's not all. Then the next statement says, and takes the spoils. See, some of y'all just bind the devil. I don't bind the devil. I take what he's been keeping from me. Matter of fact, he already bound. Christ bind him. But to get the kids to, to go and collect the stove and the refrigerator and the CD play and all the stuff that belongs to you is a difficult job for God to do, to get people to go and get their stuff. You are not saved just to go to heaven. You are saved to establish the kingdom rulership of God on earth. To take control of the planet. That's why Jesus went to the cross. So God's goal was to bring the kingdom that we lost back in vogue. To bring it back to earth effectively now. And he does it through this great information we got from Christ. Christ says, I came to do what? To declare, to preach that the kingdom of God, of heaven, has returned. Good news. Now, watch this. Look at Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 32 says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom not to give you born again we keep thinking that the goal of God is to born you again that's not the goal of God born again is a part of the means to an end that is why if you read the four gospels carefully Jesus never preached born again not once never preached it and he never made a statement about it except once and he never spoke it to the multitudes he never preached it to the crowds he mentioned born again once to an old man two o'clock in the morning now the question is what made him mention born again because the old man asked him a question. The question was, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? The answer came, except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So born again is not the end or the goal. Born again is the process into the goal. The goal is the kingdom of God. So being born again is your passport into a new country and government. It's incredible that many people are citizens but don't know their rights. They don't take advantage of their privileges. This is why, look at the statement again. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is my father's pleasure He's pleased to give you what? The kingdom. God wants you to have kingdom. Look at the word. Look at the word slowly. King dominion. The father is pleased for you to be a king who dominates. God gets pleasure when you take charge of your environment, in charge of your future, in charge of your destiny. God gets pleasure from that. God is pleased when you are not under the circumstances. And this is why many of us miss the entire gospel. The good news is you can get the kingdom back. Let's talk about the kingdom and the church real quick. I'm going to go through fast in this segment here, so write fast. The church and the kingdom are not synonymous. Because you are a member of a church does not mean that you are experiencing the kingdom. And many, many pastors and Christian leaders have not taken the time to separate these two things. As a matter of fact, they don't preach kingdom hardly ever. What is the church and what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom existed before the church. Found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. And thirdly, the key to the kingdom was the influence of heaven on earth by the Holy Spirit through the agency of mankind. So God always wanted the kingdom to be here. 
and it existed before the church. Let's see if that's true. Uh, this verse in Matthew uh, 25, we're going to read in a minute, but that's what God wanted. He wanted a kingdom, and the kingdom was here before the church. The fall of man caused the departure of the Holy Spirit from the spirit of man, and therefore man lost the kingdom influence over the earth. God wanted to influence the world by the Holy Spirit through man, and when man lost the Holy Spirit, man lost the heavenly influence on earth. Because the Holy Spirit was God's connection between heaven and earth. Without the Holy Ghost, you have no connection between heaven and earth. So what God really wanted was for us to represent his kingdom. If I'm really moving too fast, I've got to get the tape, all right? What is the kingdom of heaven? Very important question. In the Bible, there are two statements you read all the time in the four gospels, even in Paul's writings. One statement is the kingdom of heaven. The next statement is the kingdom of God. These two statements are not the same. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are different dimensions of kingdom. Let me explain what I mean. The kingdom of heaven is the domain of heaven where the king, who is God, himself, he rules there and he reigns. So the kingdom of heaven is what? A domain. It is actually a territory. It's a place. In that domain, he exercises authority and power over that territory. So the kingdom of heaven is, is the place where God has direct influence, control, and rulership. Heaven, in the statement, kingdom of heaven, heaven is referring to the place. So whenever you see the term kingdom of heaven in the Bible, used by Jesus or Paul, they are referring to the place where God is ruler and king over the territory. A good way to examine, example again is, let's use the Bahamas. If you tell people, I am from the convent of the Bahamas, you're not talking about the government, are you? What are you talking about? You're talking about the country, the place. So you go to a far country and you tell people, I am from the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It doesn't matter who's the government. You don't care which party is in power. Or whatever. That statement has nothing to do with who's in power. It's referring to the sovereign power of the nation. But that's what it means when it says the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven means the rulership domain of the place called heaven. Everybody with me? Now, the next statement you find in the Bible is this statement, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God is any domain where the rulership, influence, and authority of God is in effect. For example, here in the Bahamas again. In the Bahamas, our beautiful country, please come and visit us. In the Bahamas, we got over 700 islands and keys. About 36 of our islands are inhabited, they say. Maybe a little less now. Well, we got in Nassau, in New Providence, the central governing seat, where the government rules from. All of these islands are called the Bahamas. But the government is on one island. Now, the government has established local government bodies in the other islands to execute the government's administration in those countries, in those islands. So when you go to one of our other islands in the Bahamas, you are still under the government, but the government is actually in Nassau, Bahamas, but in Andros or Eleuthera or Abaco or wherever you live in the Bahamas, there's a place called the local government office. That is called the government of the Bahamas. It's called a local government office. Local what? Government. It's not called the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It is called local government office. That is where the government, who happens to be in the power, they impact, influence, and affect what's happening in that local area. That's what kingdom of God means. Kingdom of God means God's kingdom is dominating an area. Are we, are we okay? So what God wanted was 
to stay in heaven, just like the government stays in Nassau, but to impact earth, just like the government impacts Calabash Bay, burnt ground, without going there. The government stays in Nassau. We don't move the House of Assembly to each island so we can govern it. Do we? We remain in Nassau. The government remains central. But it sends out its influence through local government and everything that's in the headquarters goes through local government and impacts the settlement. God wanted the exact same system. Still does. When they ask Jesus, how should we pray? Christ says, here's how to pray. Prayer means petition. Here's what the petition God for. Here's how to ask and what to ask for. He says what? Our Father, and he locates God. He's not on earth, he says. God doesn't move around from planet to planet. <laughs> you know, when you read the book of Revelation, interesting, eh? When you read the judgments on the earth, the judgments, God never gets involved. Follow me? When God judged the earth, God never left heaven, never got involved. He had these big giant creatures called angels. One came with a bowl of fire, next came with a bowl of farming, next came with a bowl of flood, and they began to pour stuff on the earth. God got local government, man. <laughs> and when it came to ruling earth, Christ says, here's God's program for earth. Our Father, who is not on earth, but he's in the headquarters, called heaven. Holy is your name. Reverence him, respect him. And then the next request is what? Thy kingdom come. Thy will, influence, intention, be done. Where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. I'm trying to get at something. I'm trying to show you the difference between the church and the kingdom. Local government is not the headquarters. <laughs> we just came up from Savannah, Georgia. We were driving through the city. And our chauffeur said, uh, that's the federal building of the United States. Now, what he was telling me was, here's a state called... Georgia with a town called Savannah and in that town Washington has a house There are two types of government in America some of you may not know that no know that there's called the federal government and then there's state government State government is the government that governs the state like Florida or like Georgia But federal government is the big government that governs the whole United States And in every state the federal government has a building that belongs to them and in that building are all of their staff workers and their heads of, of the departments and they execute Washington's will in the state. Now that building, well, follow me, is in every state and in every city in America. There's a federal building, federal government. They're the federation of the United States. They control the whole place. They are the headquarters. They are in Washington. Washington never moves. It stays there. It is always present. It never leaves Washington. But in every city, it's felt. Its impact is felt through the federal offices and buildings. Thy will be done on earth territory just like it is in Washington heaven so the church is not the headquarters the church is not heaven the church is heaven's local government The church is God's administrative department on earth to execute heaven's dictates in this territory. That's church. Let me show you something very practical. Is this clear? 
By the way, let me say something real deep. This is deep. Uh, have you ever heard of Washington recalling a federal office? Shutting down federal offices? No. You ever heard of a complete federal department left the state and went to Washington? Can't wait to get there. No, the very purpose for the establishment is the state. Some of you only gonna get this. This is important. See, a lot of people got when we all get to, because I don't want you all up here. That you can't wait to leave your responsibility. Lazy people. Don't want to run the territory. Don't want to take charge of the state called Earth. Jesus prayed, you know. And he is the Secretary of State. And here's what he prayed. He prayed, Father, do not take them out of the earth. If the church leaves, then earth has lost heaven's influence. I am not talking about your denomination. Sorry, your denomination. Denominations are not God's local government. In heaven, there's no record in God's constitution which says Baptist, Anglican, Methodist, Episcopalian, uh, uh, Charismatic, uh, 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 Mormon. God ain't got no list. Matter of fact, Jesus says something very interesting. He's Secretary of State. You know, he knows what's going on. He says, many will say, Lord, Lord. But based on my list, I don't know them. People claiming to represent God. He says, you're not on my list. So the church is not the kingdom. It is the kingdom's local arm of government. Let me put it this way. Matthew 25, 34 says this. Then the king will say to them on his right, Blessed are you by my father. Take your inheritance. What is your inheritance? The kingdom which was prepared for you, how long? Before the foundation of the world. So the king was here, I mean the kingdom was here before the church. Well, let me just take something here very interesting. What is the church? I want everyone to write now. This is important. What is the church? Because you see, most of us, we think that the church is this building with a steeple, with some pews, and some pulpits, with some choirs and some hymn books and, and, and some rituals and some candles and some incense and, and some clapping hands and, and singing and, and dancing. That is not the church. What is the church? When I found out what the church was, I felt stupid. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. First words of church mentioned by Jesus. Here's what he says. And I tell you that you are Peter. That means Petros. Small stone. And I will... Bill, I say, and upon this rock, that word rock there, is Petra. It means boulder, a mountain. So he called Peter a pebble, but he says, the statement you made, what, is, what, 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 what did Peter say? Thou art the Christ. He says, upon this statement you made, I'm going to build my church. I'm not going to build it on you, Peter. You are just a pebble. What I need is a slab. I need a, a, a you don't build buildings on pebbles. You build them on foundation. He said, upon this statement that you made, that I am the Christ, I'm going to build my church. So the church is not built on Peter. He's just a pebble. It's built on the statement he made, Christ. That's why the Bible says, all through Paul's writing, he says that Christ is the foundation. And no other foundation can any man lay except that which is labor, which is Christ. And he's also the chief cornerstone that keeps the whole building together. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Everybody say Hades. Yes. Write the word Hades down, please. In the King James Version, the word hell is there. I want to correct you, please, quickly. There are three words for hell in the Bible. When you read the King James, they don't distinguish them. That's why you misunderstand the Bible. The King James is a good translation, but not the best. 
The three words that the King James translates as hell are different. First word is Hades, second word is Sheol, third word is Gehenna. Here, Jesus uses a specific word. He says, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hades is referring to, write it down, it means the grave. It means death. He says, my church, death cannot destroy it. If Satan kills my people, they'll come back again. Lord have mercy. What a, what a kingdom to be a part of. When you become a citizen of God's kingdom, you become powerful and more powerful than death. Everyone that died in your family in Christ will be raised again. In the kingdom of God, death has no power over the citizens. Praise God. That is why kingdom people, kingdom people live recklessly. They live believing big things. They don't mind losing big because they can't lose. So they try big things. It's kingdom people. He says, no death could stop this church. Now, what is church? Let's find the word he used. The word he used is the word ecclesia. Ecclesia, interesting word. Write it down. The word ecclesia is a Greek word from the Hebrew word Jesus used, and it has a meaning. It means called out ones. Keep writing. It means called out ones. It is also the name that was given, write this statement down, by the Roman government to Caesar's cabinet. You get it. It's Caesar's cabinet. Write that down. So the word ecclesia was not invented by Jesus. Church was a common word used by the government. It came from the Greek concept of government. And the word ecclesia was the name the Roman emperor gave to the group of people that he personally chose to be with him. Now let's talk about our government or the United States government. Let's see how they choose their cabinets. Watch me. This is very important, very important. Now when I say important, I get ready to say something important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, notice how cabinets are chosen. Cabinets are never voted in. Oh, hallelujah. And that's the word ecclesia. Cabinets are chosen solely by the ruler, the king, or the president, or the prime minister. No one chooses the cabinet. The leader chooses the cabinet. He chooses them himself. This is so important. You don't vote people into ecclesia. You better thank God. Because if we had to vote for you to become a believer, you got enough enemies there to keep you. God, child, God, if you know what I know about God, you wouldn't put a no child, mm, preacher, mm, mm, child. If I, you know what he did. If you knew his background, you wouldn't let him be no elder. I found out something also. The leader who chooses cabinet, ready for this? He can reshuffle any time he wants. Which means God might put you in the church department one day, keep you there for three years, and decide, I shuffle it. And shuffling usually takes place when the cabinet minister ain't producing. Oh, Jesus have mercy. If you don't work when God gives you your talent, you don't come back with ten instead of five, God will reshuffle you. The more you work for God, the more God keeps you close in the cabinet. Ecclesia is the word which means called out ones. They got a whole group of folks out there in the, in the house of assembly, but you call out just a few. That is the group that is called ecclesia in the Roman government. That's why Christ could not say, upon this rock, I will build a church, 
or the church. He couldn't say that because there were other churches. I'm going to let it be quiet so you can catch what I said. See, if I say this is my watch, then it means what? There's some other watches around. But this one is what? Mine. He said, upon this statement, I am the Christ, I'm going to build my ecclesia. Caesar got his, I have mine. Caesar is Lord, I am Lord. He got his kingdom, I got my kingdom. His kingdom had quarters on earth. My kingdom is not of this world, but I got the same setup. Lord have mercy. And my objective is to take over not only the earth, but to take over Caesar's kingdom so that I will be the king of all the kings. Whoever kind of king they are. And he plans to do it through his ecclesia. Now, the Roman Empire lasted the longest in history. They lasted over 200 years. Pax Romana, they call it. Why was Caesar's empire so powerful and so effective? Uh, can, I, can I answer the question for you? It's important because it, it helps you explain why Jesus didn't come until Caesar was in power. See, Jesus couldn't come before Caesar because there was no empire established on earth that was exactly like the kingdom of God. So God would wait until the kingdom was established like his so that when he sent his son, when his son spoke, he would use words and concepts that people could understand. One of the things that made Caesar so powerful is this right here. When you study the kingdoms of the world in history, there are five of them. Five great civilizations. One, the Egyptian. Good to write this down. History. Decision. Number two, was the Assyrians. Number three was the Babylonians. And number four was the Greeks. And number five was the Romans. We are now post-Roman. Out of Rome came Europe, which came these small empires like Great Britain, France, Spain, and the Baltic states. And they began to explore the world and take over different parts of the world. That's how the Bahamas became a reality. England came and took over this island. Spain came and took over Cuba. France came and took over Haiti. They began to take over stuff. All came out of the Roman Empire. Why didn't God send Jesus during the time of Pharaoh, the Egyptians? Because Pharaoh did not have a kingdom set up like the kingdom of God. Why didn't God send Jesus during the time of Assyria? Because Assyrians did not set up the kingdom like the kingdom of God. Why didn't God send Christ during the time of Babylonians? Because that kingdom was not set up in the same structure like the kingdom of God. Why didn't God send it during the Greeks? The Greeks were never set up like the kingdom of God. Why did God say, in the fullness of time, I sent forth my son? Fullness of time means everything is in place. The setting is right. Why did God do that when the Romans took over? Because the Roman Empire was the only empire that did something that was unique. Every empire before the Romans, whenever they took over territory, they would kill the people, and then whoever's left, they took them back to their nation as slaves. So they would conquer and then rape the country and take the people with the spoils back to their nation. That's why Daniel, for example, was a slave in Babylon. They took all the slaves they conquered and brought them back to Babylonian, Babylonian culture and made them slaves. Pharaoh had slaves, took them out of their country, bring them to Egypt, made them slaves. The Romans were the first ones who didn't do it. That's why they last so long. The Romans went into a territory, took over the territory, but never took the people out. They did, they did the opposite. They sent people in. 
You'll get it later. They set up an exact replica of the kingdom of God. Caesar said, I'm not going to leave Rome, but I'm going to rule the world. So he took over territory, left the people in the territory, but he sent a governor with a cabinet representative to the territory. Pilate, for example, was a governor sent from Rome. No governor was local. They all came direct from Rome. Why? They had to have Caesar's mind, Caesar's attitude, Caesar's uh, plans. They were possessed by Caesar's thoughts. They thought like Caesar. So when they came to the territory, their job was to make the territory just like Rome. When God saw that, God says, in the fullness of time, I sent forth my son. Born of woman, born under the law. That he might redeem those who are under the law. Every word that Jesus used, listen to me carefully, was understood by the people of his day. That is what caused the problem, and that's what caused him to be attacked. They understood him. He, they did. For example, he said, I am Lord. Now, there can only be one Lord in every kingdom. So the people complained. They says, if you are Lord, then we report you to Caesar. Because we have no Lord but Caesar. He says, well, uh, I can't unlord myself. I am Lord. And I do have a kingdom. But it's not of this world. Now he's using another word that they understand. He says, and upon the confession I am the Christ, I'm going to build my cabinet. Oh, they heard him. He says, and my cabinet is, is more powerful than Caesar's cabinet. You see, when Pilate dies, he finished. But Peter, when you die, you come in back. Lord, have mercy. It's a real government. So Jesus said, through the agency of his church, he will reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. So the purpose for creating the church was very simple to Jesus. He has what it is. The church is a chosen, appointed, called out group of people just like the Roman government cabinet. If you are a born again believer today, I am here to tell you that you are uh -oh, a government official. Now it's tough to get that through your head. When you go to work tomorrow, can you imagine? You can walk in your job and say, good morning, everybody. The honorable so-and-so has just arrived to work. <laughs> oh, come on. The Bible says he will crown you with honor. My job in this ministry is to train you for the work of your ministry to get you thinking correctly. People treat you the way you treat yourself. Man, y'all talk to me. Some of the folks in our cabinet right now, you group with them. Am I right? Yeah, the folks in government in the Bahamas. Some of you know them well. But when you meet them, you got to say, Mr. Minister, you cannot call them by their first name. Why? Because the position they are in, you all ain't company no more. In their official capacity, your attitude toward them got to be different. Well, that's why God sent this word to you this morning. He's telling you that you are a government official. And you represent a government that is higher than the government in the Bahamas, in America, in Jamaica, in Haiti. So when they picked me up in a Rolls Royce the other day, I sat back and then my wife and I sat there. I said, you know, I deserve every single lick of this. I apologize for that and they drove me 
Three days, man, in, in, in Rolls Royce. I was, hi, everybody, hi. My wife is down <laughs> You know, hey. If you talk cheap, look cheap, act cheap, smell cheap, people can give you cheap gifts. You are a government official, say it with me. I am a government official. So when you walk out of here, there are two sides to that appointment. One, if you are a government official, you got to act the part. So you can't just dress with your feet like walk around and slip a slip. See, you're a government official now. you dignified. you kingdom stuff. You all talk to me, man. You don't dress your hair up and get your clothes all messed up. Yes, government official. You, you know, once you realize, <laughs> glory, hallelujah. You got to change your talk, change your walk, change your attitude, change the way you fix your bedroom, how you fold up your clothes. This is a government official's bedroom. I don't think you see any cabinet ministers in our country go into the store, T-shirt. How y'all doing, child? Now, now, some got a little bit of work. They still working with some of them. But there is a training they must go through, and that's what the church is for, to train the saints for the work of their ministry until they come to the full image of the statue of Christ. Tell you, neighbor, you're sitting next to official stuff. So sit up straight. I said, I'm straight now. I said, I'm straight. I said, I'm straight. Good for your posture. You all ever see the queen sitting down? You study her. You never see a slow in a chair. Like some of y'all. She's always upright, back straight, poised. You know, she's poised. That's, that's etiquette. That's royal etiquette. I see some of y'all coming with nice hats on. I say, boy, that's nice. That's the other kid, man. Look classy, girl. Every rose in the garden in your hat, praise the Lord. All right, real quick, watch this. The church, number two, is a living organism of mankind. The government is not buildings, is it? It meets in buildings, but it's people. Do you know what we call the House of Assembly? We don't call it the government, do we? What do we call it? The government building. A government building. The church buildings are not the church. People got a little bit, you know, knocked out of their heads when I introduced this place to the Bahamas. And we introduced our name, we call ourselves the Diplomat Center. They said, I didn't know church. You're right. The building is not the church. This is where the diplomats meet to discuss kingdom policy. What is this? A government building? It's a government building. We are ambassadors. We meet here to do diplomatic work. Diplomacy is our expertise. That's what you are. The church is so spooky, we don't know what it is anymore. People are so spiritual, they're stupid, man. They're only good enough on Sunday. They're worthless on Mondays. Can't do nothing. Can't work in a boardroom, can't work in a business, can't establish nothing, can't deal with money, can't manage their own bad behavior, can't manage their loins, can't manage nothing. Spiritual on Sunday and stupid on Monday. I mean, it's, it's, the church got to stop that, man. We are a powerful diplomatic call. Can I hear an amen anyhow? Living organism, number three, write this down. The church is the legal agency of God on earth. The legal agency of God on earth. The government of the nation is not the legal agency of God. God established authorities, but his agency is the church. What is an agency? An agency is, a, is an organization that services you for someone else. You know, they got insurance agencies. Okay, there's a difference between an insurance agency and then an insurance company. Two different 
An agency is a company that's working for another company. Maybe in Canada somewhere, the insurance company is using an agency to service the Bahamas, and you give them your money, take the money, send it back to Canada. Get it? That's an agency. Agency is the thing in the middle. But that's exactly what the church is. The church is not the government of God. It is the agency through which the government works. We service the world for God. So when the world wants to do business with God, they shouldn't go direct to heaven. They're supposed to come to the agency. You, sitting in that office on that construction job, that plumber, you're supposed to introduce the government to the people on your job. Lord, have mercy. If you're a student, the school becomes your territory to influence. You are a teacher, you are God's agency to those students. They should meet God through you. The church is God's agency. Number five. Number four. The church is the administrative arm of God's government on earth. Practical stuff, eh? Administration. When God wants to heal some people, he sends his administrators to take care of it. Lay hand, you lay hands on the sick, he says, and I will raise them up. You lay hands on them, I will raise them up. You the agency, I am the source. You don't heal nobody, you just set up the situation for me. You get your hands on their heads, set it up for me, good. Now I'm going to send the resources through you. And the person gets healed. That's why you can't take the glory when a person gets healed. It goes to the government. Number five, I like this one. The church is God's diplomatic core on earth. Diplomacy is our responsibility. We represent the heaven on earth. And finally, the church is heaven's earthly senate. You know, when the senators agree, things become law, you know that. God said, whatever you agree on earth, heaven will do. No matter how much bills the whole assembly may pass, may, 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 may create, they got to send it to the Senate. And the Senate decides if it becomes law. God says, look, I got a lot of things I want to do on earth, but I send it to my Senate first. And if my Senate agree on it, it happens on earth. Some of y'all can get it, yeah. See, some of you folks get it. See, so that's why even though God wants to bless you, heal you, deliver you, prosper you, he can't do it until he gets somebody to agree with you because you're the Senate. Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, we ain't get the keys yet. We can get the keys probably around October. But I tell you, my mind's just blowing right now. It's going like a thousand miles an hour. The keys just blew my mind. The way the Senate works. Some of you are getting delivered right now. Don't even know it. The word of God is going into you. You understand in this? And you're getting delivered right now. Lift your hands and say, Lord, thank you that you elevated me to authority and to the Senate of God. Whatever I agree on will happen today. Hallelujah. Wherever any two shall touch and agree concerning anything where on earth it shall be done, our Father who is in heaven. He releases it. All right? Now, this last list here, I want you to get this real, real, real quick. The goal of the church, they told me I got 10 minutes, the goal of the church is to serve as God's agency to call men back to their source. What do diplomats do? They represent a the government. And their job is to represent their government to the place they are in. That's the goal of the church. The goal of the church is to call humans back to God through the Secretary of State, Jesus Christ, and to restore their heavenly citizenship through the Holy Spirit and thereby establish his kingdom on earth in their presence. And to do it presently in this time. That sentence is important. It explains the entire work of the church. The church's job is to go and bring citizenship back to people who lost citizenship from heaven. When Adam sinned, he cut off citizenship. God sent his son back, Secretary of State, to bring back 
the agency to establish citizenships again so that we can have all the rights and privileges that are written in this constitution right here in my hand and that's what God wants for you and the church's job is to bring people back to that citizenship I put a conclusion here in essence the church is the means and the kingdom is the end we've made the church the end come to church and that's it that ain't true <laughs> your responsibility is to go out of this government building and to enter every discipline of life that you work in and to invite citizens back to their original kingdom but prepare for them before the world began so they can defy death and live prosperously in the earth now the church has made itself the end rather than the means and this is wrong we worship the church instead of worship the God of the church we are so bent on keeping our traditions we don't want God to interfere with them We organize our services. We got them all typed out. God, you better not touch this. God, wait a minute. You work for me. I don't work for you. I'm the government. Matthew 15, verse 1. Jesus says, you've made your traditions more important than the law of God. We begin to worship the things that are supposed to be the means. Some of y'all say, right, I'm sorry about that. What's the mission of the church? The mission of the church is to represent the government of God on earth and to serve as what? Ambassadors. I can't hear you. Ambassadors. Let's say it out loud, all together. Read the whole thing. The mission of the church is to represent the government of God on earth and to serve as ambassadors of heaven, recruiting citizens for the kingdom of God. Is that simple enough? That's what we're here for. Whether it is business, politics, nursing, teaching, mechanics, media, computer science, whatever area you are in, you are sent there to be an ambassador to recruit citizens back to the kingdom of God. And these people you're recruiting are simply citizens who lost their passports. That's why they're aliens. God sent you to naturalize their immigration status. Ephesians 3.10 said it real clearly. It says, His intent, speaking of God, was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms according to His eternal purpose. Through who? The church. God wanted the rulers in the heavenly realms to know what he is like through the church. How long did he have this idea? It was his eternal purpose. The church was not God's recent idea 2,000 years ago. Adam was church. Adam was God's first cabinet. He was God's first secretary on the earth. He was God's first rep. And Eve joined the cabinet later. And then they got together and they decide to declare independence from the government of God. When you declare independence, it means you cut off relationship. So now earth is ruled by people who ain't got no contact with the government in heaven. And now man is under some rulership that is not godly. So God sent back his son to reconnect you back to heaven. Citizenship is what this is all about. The ministry of the church. The church, you have five minutes. The church as an organization does not go to, to the world, but exists to train the saints to go. It's important, please. Write that down, please. The church itself does not go to the world. It trains its agents to go to the world. You know, those of you who sell insurance, you all know about this, eh? You work for an insurance agency? The company doesn't go, they send you. 
and you go talking to people. You knock on doors, you visit people at work, you talk to them about insurance. That's what the church is for. This building is where we meet. I am an undersecretary of state. I work for the government. My job is to train you as diplomats and agents to go out and to recruit people to buy into the assurance of heaven. So your pastor is not really supposed to make altar calls. The altar calls must be made at your desk or at that mechanic job or over that computer you're talking to somebody over the water machine or at lunch you take somebody out. That's the altar call. You bring them here for me to train them. So well, why our church ain't growing? Because you ain't growing. It ain't growing because you ain't going. We've trained the saints to work the ministry. And so the church sends out agencies. Agents. Number two, Ephesians 4.10. It was he who gave some to be apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to what? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I prepare you to go. You build the body up. Every week this place should be growing. Every single week there should be somebody coming into the citizenship. I'm a salesman trainer. <laughs> Go out and share what you learned today to the people on your job this week. Tell them about their rights that they can gain in citizenship. Tell them the good news that they can regain authority over their circumstances. Tell them the good news that there's nothing that God will withhold from them if they walk uprightly with Him. Ephesians 6. I close on this verse. I want to get to a list where we pick up the next week. Ephesians 6 19 says pray also for me Paul is asking the church to pray for whenever I open my mouth words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am keep reading an ambassador in chains pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should Paul says, look I'm an ambassador and I'm changed up chained up to Jesus I belong to the government he said, pray that I would have the right words to fearlessly declare the information about my government wherever I go. Pray that prayer for yourself, eh? Let's pray it out loud. Go. Pray also for me that I may open my mouth, words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the good news for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should this week. That's your job. The government is depending on you. The government loves those citizens who are hiding because they're not legitimate. Illegal immigrants always hide. They hide in bar rooms and discos and zoos. They hide all over the place. They hide in car seats in the night. They hide in base houses. They, they know they're illegal. They're afraid of the light. Go to them and tell them the government is not angry at them. The government has paid the price for their citizenship. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.